Okay, it's time for the March wrap-up. I think it was a pretty good reading month, all things considered. I went on a week-long trip, and then I got sick for a week, and I still read everything I wanted to read, I think. Well, maybe some things fell off the TBR, but all my obligations were met, and I generally had a pretty good time. So I think goals were met. I didn't have to DNF anything. There was nothing I was like, I... I okay, correction. There was one book that I probably would have DNF'd, but it was short, and I didn't mind finishing that project, per se. But okay, there is one book that I knew I should have DNF'd it, but I didn't. So like a little anti my goals, but it's only one. So we're, we're gonna go with it. And I read nine things. Generally have I over a four star average rating, which is pretty cool, love that. And I finished a big book that I started since January. So that's also awesome. As I'm filming this, I am currently in the middle of zero books, which is wild. <laughs> Um, because of some short story collections and a nonfiction, I have been in the middle of books pretty much all year, no matter what. And so like, I am in extreme clean slate mode. That's going to last for probably another 30 minutes to an hour, but currently everything is done. <laughs> so per usual, I'm going to put things into some groups and we're going to go through my thoughts about these books this month. I will point to any relevant videos that might exist for more in-depth thoughts if you want those. And here we go. So. Let's see on my handy dandy post-it note, what is the first category we should go into? Let's go into drama, because I have two books that I'm like, good drama, fun times, maybe not like my favorite thing, but they, they brought the drama. And so we'll start with Chain of Thorns, the last book in the Last Hours trilogy by Cassandra Clare. Um, my continuing journey through the Shadowhunter world that nobody saw coming. This was not on anyone's 2023 bingo card for me, myself included. But here we are, I finished this. And honestly, it was it was almost a four and a half star until the last third of the book had to care about plot. Like what? <laughs> I pretty much really love the melodrama of character relationships in the Shadowhunter world. That's not a thing that's a secret. I talk about it a lot. And I thought for the first two thirds of this book, the way we handled all of our character interactions and relationships, the ones that have tension, the one that we're finally maybe going to come together. I was having a lot of fun with all of our pairings. And then we kind of got to a point where all the pairings were settled. And then I still had like 150 pages left of the book. <laughs> And I just, her plots, are they don't do it for me. I think they would do it for me if I was watching them, like if this was a TV show. But as it stood, I was very bored and had nothing to do while reading the last part of this book. I was like on a plane. And so yeah, that, the end of the book is why it's not a four and a half star. But I'm also used to this in Cassandra Clare books. So it wasn't like disappointing for me or anything. It's like, yeah, per usual. I like the second to last book more. Here we are. The other one is Golden Sun, which there is a live show on Alex Nieves' channel. The um, giveaway is still open for that. It's open everyone, internationally and everything. Go check out that video in the pinned comment for information on how to enter. Um, and so Golden Sun, this was, this was a fascinating reread experience because I read these three books in such quick succession. I don't know what happens in the middle. I can't remember. It was five years ago. And then, you know, I come onto booktube like three years ago and people talk about Red Rising. It's really popular. And people are always like, well, if you don't like Red Rising, get to Golden Sun. Golden Sun's the good one. And I, that was just literally not my experience. But again, it all blended together. And so now rereading being like, okay, I'm reading the good one. <laughs> and for me, it's not as fun. Um, I give this four stars. I give Red Rising four and a half stars. And I think it's because that Golden Sun's plot is so chaotic. Intentionally so. Like, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, except it just made it harder for me to feel grounded and want to keep going, if that makes sense, because you just couldn't breathe. Every two or three chapters, a big thing happens and you just don't get to settle. And especially now that I'm older, I like settling in my books. When I'm reading, I want to be able to sit down, settle, sink into things. I do love when things twist and turn. That's hence this is in the drama section of this wrap up. But this was a little a lot for me and my tastes. Um, so it's just really interesting that this one that I don't think is as tight plot wise, and I still think it has all the characterization flaws that I have with the first book is the one people really like significantly more. Like for people who like Golden Sun, I think it's just a completely different reading experience than Red Rising. But for me, they're comparable. And I like Red Rising's more formulaic, comfortable plot narrative device more for some reason. I don't know. So yeah, we have a live show where we go in depth 
and like, you know, they grill me about why I don't like it as much. Not really. It's a really fun conversation if you want to check it out. But these were my two drama books. And now I guess we'll go into like my more negative thoughts to get that out of the way and then we can end more positive. Although not all three of these are not negative. It's just that like their connective tissue is kind of um, colonialism and oppression maybe potentially. I don't know it's a stretch for one of the books but also not a stretch and I, I don't even know if that's kind of a spoiler to bring that up. I don't think it is. But essentially oppression, colonial oppression, whatever I've tagged here. Um, you know depressing topic in general. So my least favorite of this batch is Far From the Light of Heaven. And you might be thinking, Angela this is a sci-fi murder mystery. No one ever talks about colonialism with this book. Colonialism actually plays a huge part in this, uh, or at least the oppression of people and taking resources. I won't say how, but that is actually a large thing in this story that you will find out as it's uncovered. Um, that's not why I don't like this book, though. I actually think that's one of the most compelling parts of the book. Uh, it's actually why I'm really glad I finished it. Also, the afterword is so good. <laughs> I want to read the story that Tad A. Thompson talks about in the afterword. To me, that's not what this story was. He kind of actually admits that he's um, staying away from a lot of common science fiction tropes while putting this together. And I think that's commendable, but also did leave me feel ungrounded. I, I just didn't have a good connective grasp of this story. And maybe it's because it was just too much, not what I'm used to. I think that's also paired with for some reason, we do spend quite a bit of time in backstories and present day with our large cast of characters, because this is a larger cast of characters than I thought it would be, because it's kind of like an isolated spaceship story. Um, and the cast of characters does grow quite exponentially. But I never really felt like this cast of characters vibrancy, and I could tell so much thought and care went into each of these characters. So it's not like that wasn't there and it wasn't part of them. These are not cookie cutter characters, but how they are written I was struggling to give them that 3D look that I knew was there because I was given literally the bare essentials to connect to them. It, that's what it felt like to me, at least. Um, and I think maybe it would have been better if we focused on only three characters instead of, I don't know, I think by the end we've had six or seven point of views. And then there are certain things and ways that reveals are brought out that weren't to my taste for this type of mystery sort of um, motivation. And we all know this is kind of a hard sell for me anyways. I don't love mystery-driven plot arcs. They are not as intriguing to me as they are most people, but this did have some light horror to it. It was interesting. I just think that because we weren't using a lot of normal conventions, some of the stuff just didn't land for me. Like, there were some reveals that I'm like, wait, that's how we're handling that reveal? Okay, I feel like it'd be a bigger deal, but here we are. And then it also has some of those kind of like we're in space and space is always trying to kill us vibes. And I feel like I knew things were tense, just like how I knew these characters were full of life and complexities, but it didn't translate to me. Like there was a barrier between what the book was doing and how my brain was interpreting it. And it was pretty much consistent the entire time, which is what led to a pretty fine experience. And I really can't put my finger on why. Um, because even though this is a short book, I didn't actually think that it didn't linger when it was supposed to either. It's, it's a really hard book for me to critique because I think it's just probably this writing style just doesn't communicate well with my brain. And that's really unfortunate because this author has really interesting ideas. I really do like how we bring up the oppression of people and the taking of their resources into this story. And I have to be vague about it because it's plot related. But I really thought that was fascinating. I really like the idea that the space race and how this goes, Lagos is our main hub where all the space stations travel to and come back. So the Afrofuturism or African futurism of this story is really awesome. There, there's a lot of good bits in here, but the writing style or just the execution, because it's not even like the writing style is bad. I have no issues with the individual sentences. So that was... That was a disappointing time, but I was kind of prepared just because a lot of people with similar taste to me have had similar experiences. And now Babel, which is obviously very tied <laughs> to this theme. I have the secret video that I posted on April 1st that has so many of my thoughts. So I'm really going to point you there because I, I talk for like 15 minutes about this book, spoiler free. But essentially, I liked it a tiny bit more than I thought I would, which is exciting. <laughs> and I think it's because it does stuff at the end that I'm like, okay, this this is better than a three-star read because of what you're doing in the last fourth and fifth part of this book. Um, I really liked, because I mean, with this type of story, we are writing ourselves into kind of a plot corner that a lot of stories put them in. And I'm like, so how in our scenario are we getting out of this corner? Like, what is our, 
How are we doing that? And I liked how she answered that question. Um, so in terms of a thought experiment, I enjoyed that. In terms of me enjoying a story, there's a lot that didn't land for me. And that was unsurprising because I've kind of learned that how Arv Kwong tells stories doesn't always land for me. Um, it just, I, I started learning that when I read The Poppy War. Um, so I wasn't surprised. I kind of get the hype. I'm still confused about it. I mean, I do think the ending is really a fun answer to the thought experiment she set up. I don't think that that's big enough for me to put this on the tier that a lot of other people do in their reading life, especially compared to a lot of other sci-fi that covers these themes. But it was also really interesting reading this while I was finishing the next read I'll talk about, Open Veins of Latin America, because this is basically the nonfiction real life version of what Babel's talking about. Um, to the point where we learn where the silver comes from in open veins of Latin America. In Babel, it is mentioned. One of the mines that I learned a lot about in this book was mentioned in Babel, but it's mostly about how China has a stockpile and England wants it and free trade and all of, all of that, you know, messy stuff. And open veins of Latin America, I think, contextualized a lot of it for me. So I understood what Arv Kwong was doing and pulling from what part of history she's really trying to bring to light in an accessible way. Um, but for me, Open Veins of Latin America, I think, um, is better for me. Just for me and my taste where I am in learning about things and contextualizing sy systems. I mean, Open Veins of Latin America is a hard read for so many reasons. It's, it's dense. It hits you with a lot of facts and dates and statistics. And then one, and then the next minute, you're hit with a lot of human stories. And I, I kind of wanted more human stories, but I understood the point of this was this author in the 1960s, this is published in 1971, is like, this is my thesis on why we have all of these resources and we are some of the poorest nations on the planet. Like, that's the thesis. And I feel like when you are trying to aggressively say that in the 1960s to 1970s, you have to bring all of your facts. And even then, people are like, this is trash. This is propaganda. You know, I mean, even nowadays, there's a strong bias to this to the work. I appreciated when the author got a little more conversational. I wish there could have been more space for that because I think that's when this nonfiction was at its strongest. And so it's interesting because for me, I appreciate Open Veins of Latin America because it's so real. I mean, it's, it's not his, it's not fiction. This isn't historical fiction. This is nonfiction. Um, but I understand that Babel is trying to take what is actually probably really inaccessible in a nonfiction work like Open Veins of Latin America. It's a hard read. It's like a textbook and trying to make it incredibly palatable and make it so no one can miss the themes that she's trying to put through. And you know, in some ways, I don't love that type of theming from her specifically. It doesn't feel cathartic for me like it does other people. But at the same time, I respect it. Like, you know, if you're going to say something with your chest, you say it with your chest, right? Like, you just do it. Um, so it was fascinating reading those close to each other <laughs> because they were doing very similar things incredibly differently. Um, so, yeah, that's this category of the world sucks all the time. And, you know... I, I always know the world sucks, but I was being reminded extra a lot near the end of the month. <laughs> All right, now moving into books that I generally just loved. Um, okay, we're going to go with hauntings. That's our next category, hauntings. I read two books that related to this. The first, The Sentence by Louise Erdrich. Oh my god. Oh my god, I love this book. I love it. I just love Louise Erdrich. I can't, I think there's one book I've given four stars by her that I've read. I think another was a four and a half and the other two are five. Like just, I love her books. My favorite books of this year have not been speculative. I mean, this technically has, like I said, a haunting, but do not read this if you want a ghost story because that's really not what it is. It's actually, um, I think Louise Erdrich processing 2020. Like, I think that's what this book is. So with that comes all of the trigger and content warnings of 2020. The pandemic, <laughs> the, the George Floyd situation, all of that is in this book. Because we are taking place in the town where that incident happens. Um, we have a bookstore that our main character works at after she has get, gotten out of prison after, I want to say a decade she was in prison for, which gets explained in the first chapter why she was put in prison and she works at a bookstore. And it's about her life in this community and who she is as a person and her complex relationship with her mother. And in all of that, you see her processing the end of 2019 into 2020 and her own family relationships. And there is this haunting of their most annoying customer. She passes away and still comes to the store as a ghost. And that is definitely a part of the story. But I wouldn't say that's the main part. And like, all I can say is, once again, the sense of community and place is what I love. It's what I come for. I felt like 
I was reading someone's life in a really interesting way. I just, I was so engaged while I read this. I was on a plane at like seven in the morning, which you know, when you have to be on a plane at seven in the morning, you've woken up at like, depending on how far away the airport is, maybe four, maybe 4.30 in the morning. I was awake for a long time. And I didn't take a nap. I just read this book until we landed and I couldn't put it down because even though, is it plot driven? Not really. It's very slice of life. It, it, you know, it's very character focused. It just, I can't look away. I love these types of books. So if you think you can handle 2020, I really recommend it, especially because it is such an interesting cap. It, it captures our uh, the moment in a way that I find really impactful. I don't know. I'm just really glad this exists, that this documentation of this artistic interpretation and reflection of 2020 exists. I'm really happy about it, especially that it was done by one of my favorite authors. So that's a ramble. Um, and then the other one I read, I actually just finished a couple hours ago, is House of Good Bones. House of Good Bones, T. Kingfisher. Another T. Kingfisher this year. I'm doing great. Actually reading authors I like. And this was really fun. Not my favorite T. Kingfisher. I can't really put my finger on why, but I had a blast. Like, I, especially the end of this book, I really enjoyed the end of this book. The end of this book might make me raise the rating. As I'm filming this, I thought it was a four-star read, and I might still land on that. But the ending was like, I couldn't put it down. <laughs> so that was a really strong ending. We have this woman, Samantha, who has to go visit her mom in North Carolina because the dig she was supposed to be working on kind of got put on hiatus because they found human remains. And so she's going home, and suddenly her mom's not acting like herself. And, like, this is a haunted house story. That's what, that's the cover of the book. You go home, your mom's not acting like herself, suddenly the house is all different. And so Samantha, this scientist character, first of all, her relationship with her mother is fantastic. I loved it. I love Samantha's inner dialogue. This is a first person story. Samantha has an incredibly strong voice. If you do not get on with her inner monologue, you are not going to like this book. <laughs> but I really like Samantha. And so how she thinks about the world, like there was a moment when she was basically before falling off to sleep discussing the like, she's like, she's into bugs, but she was comparing metamorphosis cycles of bugs to like crochet work. I just freaking love her. She's great. Um, and it's about her, you know, being back in this house that she briefly grew up in because it was her grandmother's house. So she has this relationship to this place, but it's not necessarily happy memories and it's not really her hometown. And she's remembering people on the street that she knew growing up. And then there's this handyman who's around. And like, I just really like how T. Kingfisher adds in just a little bit of like, I don't even know if I would call it romantic tension, but flirting. I don't know. The banter between all the characters is always why I'm here for it. And it is a creepy haunted house story. It's not my favorite haunted house story, but it's creepy and unsettling. And yeah, and at the end, I'm like, I, what is happening? So, and also, I don't think before this book, I would have ever really thought vultures were cute. They're adorable. They're freaking adorable. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like Hermes. <laughs> freaking love Hermes. So again, this brought me a lot of joy. I really enjoyed it. So it probably should be a four and a half star now that I'm just like, rambling about it. We'll see. We'll see if editing Angelo agrees after some more time has passed. Because like I said, I just finished it like two hours ago. But super fun new release. If you like T. King Fisher, I think you're going to like this. It, it has her voice. Like that's that, you know, if you read authors for their voice and their uniqueness that they bring based off that, T. King Fisher, man. Now our last category is, I'm just going to call it the fixing the boat trope, even though neither of these have boats in them. <laughs> uh, anyways, these are also two books that I read while I was sick, and they were lovely. Um, first, we'll talk about Elantris. This was my reread, well, one of my rereads of the month. I also read Golden Sun, and I was reading this, and you know, it's my fourth time reading it. I got really um, nostalgic about it, and also was focusing on things a little differently. And the thing I kind of latched onto this time was the focusing on systems and communities and what you do for the common person, because I think that's actually something Elantris digs into more than I remember. Like, not a lot. Again, don't go to Sanderson for, like, intense theme work, because that's really not where he shines. But for me, I really loved watching Elantris, like, the city itself and the community being built again. That's always been one of my favorite parts. Um, when you're in Elantris with one of our characters who gets thrown in, you see how they are forced to live, and then you get to see them fighting against that new, like, that old status quo of just, you deal with it. Life sucks in Elantris, you know? Like, but fighting against that and what is built out of that, I really love. I still love Serene. I'll never not love Serene. She is a formative character for me. And then Harathan, every time, you know, when I first read Harathan, I'm like, I'm bored. Every time I'm in his perspective, when I was a kid, I'm like, Harathan, boring. Give me back to Serene and Rowden. 
nope. And, and as an adult, every time I'm like, he's an interesting character. Um, so yeah, and even though it's like watching a movie I've seen 20 times because I just know the plot beats, I always have a fantastic time. We are having, or already have had a live show about this on my channel with Roger and Stephanie and Jesse, and I'll have a link to that down below if you want to see our spoiler thoughts, because there's also some, I'm sure we, I, I'm filming this before that conversation's happened, but it was also really interesting being like, man, the groundwork for the Cosmere and how all of the magic systems kind of, they're different, but have this underpinning mechanistic glue. I, I'm excited to unpack that. So that's Elantris. And then the last book we'll talk about is Legends and Lattes, which well, I mean, we're building a coffee shop. So that's definitely, we're, we're building something from the ground up. And I read this in a day, like I talked about in my secret project video. So I'll point you to that. Cause again, I talked about this book for like seven minutes over there. Um, but this was a blast. This was one that I was really happy that I am with the popular opinion. This was delightful. <laughs> I was really nervous that I wouldn't be on this side of it. I, I was, I don't want to be the person who doesn't like the cozy warm hug of a book. I really don't want that type of title. And I do like it. So that was really great. Um, mainly because like I said, it is that trope of everyone coming together to build something in a community. And I think part of it is that it is truly fantasy. <laughs> Like, obviously, in little circles of localism, things like that happen in the real world, but I feel like in the real world, I am more always bombarded with how much things don't work, how hard it is to have something grow organically and be in a healthy community. And so I love reading about it because it truly is, to me, incredibly fantastical. At least it feels like that more and more each day, unfortunately. <laughs> Can't you tell I finished Open Veins of Latin America yesterday? I am still... Oof, that book. Oof. All right, that's this video. What did you read? What were your highlights, lowlights? And if you want to just leave an emoji to let me know you are here. Ooh, I don't know. Leave, it's probably not a vulture, right? Like I really want a vulture, but I guess I'll take a bird or a house for a house of good bones. House with good bones, you know, the new T. Kingfisher. Emoji inspired by that book cover, whichever country you're in. <laughs> And otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.